seminar in history and philosophy of science. And um, it is my great pleasure to welcome as our first speaker, Professor Obaldi from the University of Sussex, who will be speaking on current contractualization and the online news. The rule of the house for those who are attending for the first time is that we were here one year, oh, one, one hour talk, <laughs> and then there will be up to one hour of discussions, after which everyone is invited to join for a beer at uh, Beer House Siegfried. Nearby, we can all work together there and continue discussing if there is more to discuss over a glass of beer. In my talk, we have to talk. Uh, well, well, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, it's, uh, it's a great honour to be here to, to talk about uh, Newton. Um, that's Isaac Newton, uh, you've probably seen pictures of him. That's Godfrey Neller, the great portrait artist of 1689. So we're, we're talking about uh, uh, the, the uh, archival remnants of uh, a real man. Um, that's 1702, same artist, uh, just at the time he's uh, in his second. Uh, the first one was painted while he's a member of parliament for the University of Cambridge, and this is painted as he is in his second term as a, a member of parliament. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about two things. So this is really two sorts of paper. One is the problem of uh, coherence, uh, which interests me, and I hope it interests one or two other people. Uh, so that is the problem of uh, what the relevance of an author is in understanding any text. Uh, what is the relevance of the other writings of that author, if we can identify them, in illuminating the piece of text that we want to look at? Um, when is it permissible, when is it useful to look at contextual textual elements to shed light on or explain uh, a piece of work. So in, in a sense, I'm, I'm interested in uh, what makes an author an author, uh, and I'm going to be talking about how people have thought about the coherence and incoherence uh, of Newton's writings over a period of 300 years. Uh, and then I want to talk about the... Um, <laughs> I want to talk about the, uh, the, the, the Newton project the Venetian Project is uh, the, the online uh, edition of Newton's writings um, that has been running uh, for 15 years. Um, Newton was born, I should say, in 1642. Actually, in this country, he was born in 1643. <laughs> he was born on Christmas Day, 1642. Where I come from, he's born on the 4th of January. 1643 here. Uh, he died where I come from on the 20th of March, uh, 1727, and here he died on the 31st of March. Um, so what, what we have, uh, I think, is an unbroken chain of custody of his writings uh, from his death on the 20th of March, 1727. Okay, so I want to suggest that the uh, that with the uh, availability of the online environment, uh, we, we can, um, this is somewhat boastful and apocalyptic, but we can uh, put to an end some of the problems that have bedeviled Newtonian scholarship over the last uh, 300 years. Um, when we uh, do intellectual history, or when we do uh, indeed other kinds of history, history of science, history of philosophy, uh, we make a, a strong commitment to <laughs> there was somebody uh, like uh, Descartes or Newton, uh, we think that they uh, produced a, a discernible body of work across a wide range of different fields. Uh, we, I think that's important. We, we assume that there is a mind underlying the production of these texts and we also tend to assume, in most cases, that because writings come from the same person, that there is some essence, uh, whether it's of Newton or of Descartes, there's some kind of Newtonian essence that binds together. There's something of Newton that binds together something uh, that he wrote. 
Um, I think that's particularly true of great thinkers, uh, where um, <coughs> what we call, uh, what we might describe as incoherent, uh, or a lack of coherence between different writings is seen as uh, somehow uh, derogatory, uh, as, as if there's a real problem. Um, I think it's not only that, uh, that we concentrate on authors probably to the uh, uh, to a way that diminishes our ability to contextualize these authors but we also concentrate on narrow subject areas so although when we look at Descartes writings on optics we might appeal to his writings on mathematics or other things we tend not to uh, when we have in the past looked at Newton's writings on mathematics or uh, on natural philosophy we could uh, invoke his writings in other areas as uh, illuminating or uh, as a <coughs> form, as, as explanatory. Uh, but as a matter of fact, we have tended not to. So not only do we concentrate on individual authors, we actually specialise, uh, we have tended to specialise in the past on individual subject areas within that author's uh, repertoire. <coughs> um, however, uh, if you work in general history, um, you're told that you need to contextualise. I mean, that is what being a historian is. That is what offering historical explanations is. That's what historians are supposed to do. Um, contextualisation, uh, whether it's uh, you know taking one author, looking at a wide range of his or her works, or, or looking at um, the resources on which that person drew, the sources he or she used, or indeed looking at contemporary writings in similar domains, those shed light on uh, or are helped to explain what that person wrote. Um, so we are taught uh, in a way that I think runs against the, uh, the narrow specialisation that many intellectual historians have shown. We, we are taught actually to spread our historiographical wings and to find uh, relevant contexts. Um, in the case of Newton, uh, there has always been a problem of coherence. And I, I've written probably too much on this, but I've written something on this. And there's a long tradition actually within Newtonian historiography of trying to reconcile. Uh, different aspects of Newton's thought. Uh, as I'll say in more detail later on, the, the discipline of history and philosophy of science in Anglo-American context was founded primarily on looking at Newton's texts. His public and private writings on science, and indeed his, his revolution, the Newtonian revolution, was held to be constitutive for philosophers of science, of what a scientific revolution was. In the 1950s and 60s, and indeed to some extent prior to the Second World War, uh, Isaac Newton was held up as the epitome of, uh, of, of a scientific genius, and his achievement was held to be the exemplar of a scientific revolution. But there is a problem with, his, uh, with the coherence or the consistency of his writings, because if we look at uh, optics, and if we look at uh, Principia, um, not just superficially but in detail, they seem to be very different things. Uh, the op optics is much less <coughs> technically abstruse, it's much less recondite. Uh, it is not said of optics that only two or three people in the world could understand it. Uh, it is not said of optics that not even the author of optics could understand the text he had written, which is what they what was said of Newton's Principia. Um, but optics is written for uh, a more general audience. It's got many more uh, experiments. It's much more accessible. Uh, the Principia was deliberately written uh, to fake smatterers in mathematics. It's deliberately written to exclude a particular kind of audience. And in the 18th century, uh, there is substantial effort 
uh, expended on trying to explain why these texts are different, and indeed trying to reconcile them. I mean, people still do it. You know, historians of philosophy, historians of science, still try, there's this, this kind of Nietzschean will to reconcile these two texts, to find some common methodology. It's as if, you know, that there's a, the, the, the profession militates against the more relaxed attitude, which would be to say, look, there's a methodology appropriate to this domain, and there's a methodology appropriate to this domain, but instead, uh, people in, in, I think, a very, uh, I, won't say, I won't use the term onanistic, because it's really <coughs> how I just did, but there's a very sort of navel-gazing uh, uh, and reflexive, sometimes solipsistic effort to reconcile those two methodologies, to devise new hermeneutical tools to reconcile the methodologies. But I would say that, that those new tools end up telling you more about the person who's devised the tools than it does about Newton. My view is that uh, Newton's work is radically compartmentalised. I think that's the case, I have to say, with a lot of thinkers. That doesn't mean, in all that chaos, that I don't think that that means we can't do anything by way of reconciliation <coughs> or finding connections, but I think that we should start off with the idea that um, people like Newton, Newton is no different from anyone else, they write in different styles, with different arguments, uh, they use uh, different, they have different epistemological commitments, different methodological commitments, depending on the discipline or genre in which they work. And the discipline or genre is more powerful and more significant than the fact that the person who's written in these genres is the same person. That's my view. Um, so it doesn't bother me that the optics and Principia are different because that's what I would expect. I, I would not try and reconcile those methodologies. It might be interesting to do so up to a point, but then you reach a point beyond which you're merely imposing yourself on your subject matter. And we're not just talking about optics and Principia because, of course, it is known in the 18th century uh, that Newton did work on chemistry. Uh, we now call most of that alchemy. Uh, some people call it chemistry with a Y. Um, it is known that Newton did work on chronology, so that's the history of the world before Jesus Christ. And it's known that Newton did work on prophecy. Uh, there are many things that are still not known. Uh, and some of these are, these are known unknowns, to use Donald Rumsfeld's terms. It's known that Newton did some church history. The fact that he wrote four million words plus on it was unknown. Uh, the, the exact nature of his work in church history, which is radically anti-Trinitarian, radically anti-Catholic, that is not known. I think outside a very, very narrow group of about four or five people. Um, when you have that, that very large number of different domains in which Newton works, I think it's impossible to find any one particular approach or method that characterizes everything. People have tried to do it. Uh, they've tried to say uh, that uh, Newton took a uniquely... Uh, addictive or, or a unique commitment towards precision. Uh, everything he did, he tried to find evidence, uh, he tried to find, uh, he tried to create a theory which would be backed by evidence. I don't find any of these, uh, these accounts anything other than hagiographic and banal. So we end up saying, yes, Newton was a genius, uh, and, where, and where we point to elements where he was very concerned with exactitude. It doesn't distinguish him from many, many other people. Um, his, his efforts to link reason and experience, theory and experiment, they, they don't distinguish him in general from other people. When you get uh, people trying to think about these things in the Enlightenment and then in the 19th century, we, we start to see this peculiar hierarch hierarchization of the disciplines. So this is, if you like, an inversion of what you would have found in the 16th, 17th centuries. So by the end of the 18th century, start of the 19th century, Newton's work in the exact sciences and 
in mathematics, um, so the natural sciences and mathematics. Uh, they are held up as, as worthy, uh, useful, uh, rational, enlightened, modern, forward-thinking. The other stuff is unfortunate. The, uh, all the time he spent as um, a senior administrator, I, I should add, you know, for the last 30 years of his life, uh, Newton is effectively in charge of the production of coinage and money. He's in fact, he is effectively in charge of determining the relationship between the value of gold and silver in, first of all, the English and then the British currency system. Um, in his spare time, he writes millions of words on chronology and prophecy. In the late 18th century, people lamented the fact that this great man, uh, and this goes on right until the end of the 20th century, people lamented, they cried tears, that uh, Newton had wasted his time on such uh, pursuits. You see it very clearly, I think, in French Enlightenment discourse that uh, it particularly after it becomes known in 1822 sorry, that Newton had had a nervous breakdown in 1693, it's very useful for commentators because you can say with that fact that, that Newton uh, started working in the Royal Mint and he did all this work in chronology and prophecy <coughs> after he had a breakdown, after he went mad, uh, when he went senile, when his creative juices had run out. And it, it all fits very nicely into an Enlightenment and then a positivist story um, of uh, an archetypal uh, rational being. We now know that, that that's not true. He does alchemy and he's committed quite deeply to theology at the very moment when he's writing the Principia Mathematica and when he's doing his optical work. Um, I did put a few pictures in. I think that this is, by the way, this is one of about 20 odd death mask pictures that we have, or death masks. Uh, but this one is at the Wren Library, Trinity College, Cambridge. This is the, I think this is the uh, original death mask. You can just about see, that you probably can't see it there, there's a line going down the top of his face, down the middle, uh, through his nose, uh, through his chin and so on, and that's because uh, the way in which his death mask was created required two halves that were pulled apart to create the mould. Um, but if you like, that is what he really looked like when he died. For those of you that are interested, we're talking about this, about the, 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 the textual segment of this, of the person that inhabited that box. <laughs> um, so, in the 19th century, uh, people sought to understand uh, Newton and his legacy because you know Newton is held up rightly or wrongly as the founder of uh, modern classical physics, certainly of rational mechanics. Um, I mean, his mathematical legacy, I think, is uh, is more doubtful. Nicola knows more about his mathematical legacy than than I do. Um, his his work, of course, is is not. Uh, fruitful in the way that the work of Leibniz and the, uh, and the Bernoulli's uh, Euler and others is. Uh, that's, that's definitely true. Uh, but Newton still is held up as the consummate scientific genius. In fact, you know, the, the, the term scientific genius is, is invented to deal with Newton. Right? Before Newton, there is no such person as a scientific genius. Uh, because Newton was who he was, uh, in a sense, it facilitated the, uh, the appearance of the term scientific genius. Um, but what was known about Newton? Um, people couldn't give a full, coherent account of Newton uh, until they had access to all of his papers. But his papers were held by uh, the family into which, into which they had uh, arrived in 1740, uh, the Portsmouth family. Uh, and very few people had access to those papers for more than a few days. Um, there, is, it, there is some access to the papers in the 1830s uh, for about a week, but that's about it. And those people who have access to Newton's papers are extremely partial. Uh, they are trying to show that Newton was orthodox. Um, they are trying to show that he was not an anti-Trinitarian. Uh, which 
of which there are millions of words which show quite clearly he was. Uh, these people went in trying to show that Newton did not do alchemy, and yet there are over a million words of his writings which show quite clearly that he was obsessed both with the technical <coughs> understanding and the experimental practice of alchemy. Um, and those efforts to rescue Newton really uh, ruled the roost until 1872, when the fifth Earl of Portsmouth decided to, in an act of incredible generosity, to, to give the exact scientific papers, so the mathematical and scientific papers, to the nation. Uh, they, they went to Cambridge University Library. I and mean, I have 1888 up there because it took 16 years to sift out the good stuff, the, the scientific stuff, from the rubbish. They, you know, basically, they, they called it valueless, worthless rubbish. So that's all the theological and alchemical stuff. Um, and in 1888, the, 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 the sort of the, the id, the, 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 under, the mental underbelly, if I can call it that, of Newton's work went to Cambridge University, and it was made available uh, quite quickly for people to do research. The other stuff is not made available until 1936, the sale of Newton's scientific papers, um, and they are divided up. The alchemical papers went to King's College, Cambridge, thanks to the generosity of John Maynard Keynes, the economist. And the religious papers um, went through an extraordinarily tortuous journey via New York, uh, London, and a whole host of other places, ending up arriving at Jerusalem during the Six Day War uh, in 1967, um, in, in, a, in a kind of completely disorganized state. And uh, it, the, the, I think in what was then the Jewish National and Universal University Library, it's now, they're now part of the National Library of Israel. Um, they were made available for study in 1969. And uh, they, they were of some interest to historians. Um, but they're peculiar because the profession of history of science rests on I think still, by the 1960s, by the time these papers are made available, uh, they rest on the, the, the celebratory hagiography of Newton and his most important rational work. However, <laughs> there was already a cultural revolution in historiography uh, when Newton's papers were made available. Uh, in the 1960s, there there are a number of new approaches to intellectual history, uh, publications in the Journal of the Warburg and Courthold Institute, uh, the work, I think, particularly of Dame Frances Yates uh, in her great book of 1964, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, which was inspirational for a wide range of um, historians. And I think that there is what Italians call a miraculous conjunction here <coughs> Um, that this new way of looking at the past uh, was developed at the same time as a large number of these Newtonian manuscripts were made available. And it's in the 1960s and 70s that you start to see uh, a number of uh, completely revisionist writings uh, by people like P.O. Ritanzi, uh, Ted McGuire, uh, David Cooperine, and then Betty Dobbs, uh, Karen Figala, and others who pay serious attention, and uh, Frank Manuel, these people pay serious attention to the, the dark side of Newton's writings, so to the theology and the alchemy. Um, I should add that the, uh, I think only, or perhaps fewer than 10 people studied the um, papers in Jerusalem uh, between 1970 and, uh, and 1990. But the papers were made available in microfilm uh, by Chadwick Healy, the company, in 1991. And those 42 microfilm reels are, are still uh, examined by a wide range of people uh, today, even though the, the reproduction quality is, is poor. Um, so what about coherentism? Um, many of these writers reacted against the positivism inherent within 
the discipline. So, rather than wanting to see Newton's work compartmentalized between the rational and the irrational, these people said it's all part of the same thing. Um, they all proceed from Newton's mind. Uh, they are all uh, on a par with each other. I mean, don't forget Newton, uh, I think this should be obvious, but Newton took his writings on theology much more seriously than anything else. I think it's absolutely <coughs> true that while he's producing his great works in, in mathematics and indeed in, but particularly around the time of the Principia, um, He's spending hours every day reading the Bible, doing primary research on the patristic literature, uh, other elements of church history, chronology. And I think it is true, if flippant and facetious, to say that Newton does the Principia in his spare time. Um, it, it's not true in the sense that one is it's certainly not saying that Newton is, uh, it, it, you know, tosses it off without immense commitment. But it's a break in his core studies. In his core studies, as is obviously the case for a man or woman of faith, are his uh, religious studies. Um, that is why we have, you know, something like seven, six, six and a half million words of theological, chronological writings left. That's because he devoted his life to it, and he saved this stuff. That's why we have it. Uh, it was too important to be burned uh, when he died. So the, 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 the tactics of people who wrote on Newton's alchemy and uh, religion was to say that it was all connected. Um, I think that people like Betty Dobbs and Frank Manuel, who wrote on Newton's uh, non-scientific stuff, suffered from uh, a combination of euphoria and an inferiority complex. Um, by, said, by wanting to say that everything was connected, and I think uh, genuine connections were found. I mean, Frank Manuel's got a very nice piece in his book, The Religion of Isaac Newton, on the way in which Newton talks about the, uh, the being and attributes of God in a historical context. And there are paragraphs in that, um, that primary sort of draft material that are just lifted by Newton and inserted into the general scholium, or scholium, as some people put it in 1713. So, as Manuel said, there are clear connections between his church history project, where he rails against uh, metaphysicians who pollute the simple language of Christianity. There's a clear connection between that and his contemporary project of 1712-13, which was, as we've heard today, to destroy uh, that German man, Gottfried Leibniz. Um, that's really nice and interesting. Um, and I think that it sheds light on a number of elements <coughs> he's doing. Some of these people, some historians, again, with this euphoria, went further and said that uh, the theological writings uh, were the writings that served to produce and hone Newton's metaphysical positions absolute space, and so on and so forth, and that these are the things that underpinned all of his natural philosophical writings. So in a sense, rather than seeing theology as the, um, the poor sister or poor uh, member of the family, um, it turns out, in, in a kind of fairly unsubtle inversion, that theology is the core uh, of Newton's being, which I, I have some, some sympathy with. With, but the argument relies on the idea that everything is, everything is connected. However, <laughs> I want you to speak like a lawyer, as they always say, however. Mm. Uh, there are serious and, I think, devastating problems with coherentism. Um, coherentism, I think, is, is disastrously unempirical. So I think coherentism does not pay proper respect to the way that the archive really is. Uh, I think those people who try to create links between Newton's, parts of Newton's writings, creating fictitious categories like science and religion, 
is that they don't exist in this period. There's no such thing as science, and Newton definitely has faith, but he is engaged in theology, which itself needs to be broken down. Um, the, the crude categories of science and religion uh, don't really exist, and as a consequence, finding influences or connections between those two categories are also false. Right? Connections between two fictitious categories are also false. Um, I think the worst thing which has bedeviled the entire industry uh, until the last decade, perhaps, is that in order to show coherence, so in order to show that Newton was engaged in one big coherent project, uh, historians of Newton's religion have selectively looked at a number of minor, sorry, narrow canonical sources, like the General Scolium, uh, like one or two other things I can mention, um, and they have shown that uh, there are links between these texts, which are mainly to do with natural theology, and elements of Newton's natural philosophy. Um, which you would expect, because uh, quite clearly Newton assumes that the, uh, the, 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 the glorification, if I can put it like that, of God is part of natural philosophy, it's part of doing science. The, the end goal is to prove the being and attributes of God. So it's no surprise if you look at these texts that you find uh, connections. But what about the 99.99% of writings? That, I, that you can't do with that. What do you do with all his writings on prophecy? What do you do with all his writings on chronology? What do you do with his uh, scriptural exegesis? His, you know, his tens of thousands of words devoted to determining the, the true authenticity of 1 John 5, 7, 1 Timothy 3, 16, and a whole host of other putative Trinitarian proof texts. They don't fit into that same boat. You, you, you can't force them into the same methodological, uh, epistemological uh, category approach as you find in Newton's uh, other writings. Um, so historians have, um, I think, resolutely tried to find uh, texts that support the general connectionist or coherentist thesis at the expense of looking at everything else that Newton wrote, uh, so the stuff on prophecy, as I've said, and many other things. Um, and I also think that it's led not just to the selective discovery of <coughs> sources, um, but also to the uh, willful misinterpretation of these same sources. So for example, uh, unfortunately, you read in the Betty Dobbs', Betty Dobbs book, The Janus Faces of Genius, a long excursus um, on the relationship between Newton's work on alchemy, um, on the role of spirit and its relation to matter, and Newton's views of the status of Jesus Christ. And I must say that, that it is the uh, kind of pure example of a, an utterly fictitious uh, connection. Um, Dobbs does what she can to make the connection, but it's, it's disastrous at every point. And I think it's a great case study, it's a great example of what happens when uh, you, of confirmation bias, when you set out uh, to locate and then confirm uh, a pre-existing commitment to some uh, historiographical position, in this case, uh, coherentism. I think finally, um, one of the things that's bedeviled uh, the Newton industry, and indeed other industries, the, the Descartes industry and so on, is that um, when people look for contexts within a coherentist framework, they, they stop at the edges of what the author wrote. So in a sense, uh, coherentism, although it pretends to be contextually sensitive, it actually licenses, uh, of what it, it licenses ignoring what other people wrote. It's, pri it's predominantly author-centric. Like people think it's great because you're not just looking at the mathematics or the natural philosophy, you're looking at the theology as well. Or, 
obviously, you're not just looking at the theology, but you're looking at the other stuff as well. Uh, what we call the non non scientific papers, uh, otherwise known as the scientific papers. Uh, um, but it, 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 it redirects people towards the the author, and I do not think that the author is the most useful or interesting uh, category here. I think the the, the the point is that the author needs to be uh, exploded into a series of disciplinary and generic frameworks. I think the author needs to be compartmentalized. And I think that the, the online environment allows one not just to explode the author, uh, but also to locate the author in a series of uh, textual uh, resemblances or, or potential textual influences or potential textual sources uh, that one loses, that one loses track of if one just concentrates uh, fetishistically on the writings of one one author. Um, and in any case, Newton radically compartmentalized his work. Um, I can give you uh, three examples very briefly. One is uh, in a preface to uh, a treatise on prophecy. Newton makes some very clear and fascinating statements about how the kind of proofs he's offering in his uh, prophetic treatise will not convince the ungodly. So it won't convince uh, people who don't agree with him. Uh, it's a tiny bit tautological, but never mind. Um, it won't convince uh, Jews, Muslims, uh, atheists, uh, or people who are biased against Newton. <laughs> um, but it will convince those who are godly, sincere, of mind, and so on and so forth. Uh, in a sense, it will convince those who it is meant to uh, convince. Um, I gave a talk uh, yesterday um, about the, the fundamental division Newton understands between uh, the approach that one must take to the two books. Uh, one is the book of nature, one is scripture. Um, scripture is written uh, in relative or common notions uh, for ordinary people. Um, the book of nature understood properly is accessible uh, only to uh, an elite group of people. The Principia is one description of that uh, nature, it's one description of one aspect of that nature, but it's also a, a handbook that allows you to find out um, what the true absolute nature is that lies beyond your senses. So, as I said yesterday, and you can say that nauseam, you know, ordinary people, I mean, you, you have to understand that natural philosophers have a very low opinion of ordinary people, but they need to have a, a low opinion. Ordinary people cannot, the, the, the people, Henry Moore, many of you know, he actually went to Cambridge Marketplace, and he says that he talked to people in Cambridge Marketplace. <laughs> Uh, and so he has evidence that they are quite stupid. Um, <laughs> ordinary people cannot understand that the sun and the moon are really absolutely different in size. Because when they look in the sky, they subtend the same arc, and they are slaves to their senses. But clever people, learned people, uh, can tell them. Um, on the other hand, as I said, these learned people armed with the techniques in the Principia can get beyond senses to the real world. Um, and I think most importantly of all, uh, there is this, this deep division uh, between the way you can prove things in natural philosophy and what you might call a, a, a judicial or forensic approach that he takes to um, almost everything else. The forensic approach uh, Newton thinks is uh, relevant to uh, history, uh, to documents, it relies on witnesses. Uh, on a number of occasions Newton <coughs> says that um, witnesses are not to be brought into natural philosophy. We know that's a, a critique of uh, the contemporary uh, epistemic underpinnings of the Royal Society where witnessing is very important. Um, he also says that natural philosophy can become litigious, and you can see a general sort of anti 
legalistic framework in Newton's thinking, which might make you think that uh, he is shy of using uh, a legalistic, litigious procedure himself. But he's not, because he writes millions of words uh, proving litigiously that various people like Athanasius, like Leibniz, like Hooke, uh, are actually diabolical. Um, they are evil, and Newton is good. Um, they will get their comeuppance. Uh, Newton, it's true, has determined the outcome of these procedures before he's begun them, and so they have no chance. Um, but nevertheless, the, 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 the proof is, in some cases, particularly in, in the case of Leibniz and Athanasius, it's just as magnificent in its ambition and conception as anything you find in the Principia. Uh, apologies to those of you who believe other ways, but um, I think I believe that to be true. He certainly expended much more of his life uh, convicting and prosecuting, or prosecuting and convicting Athanasius than he did on the Principia, and I would suggest he spent just as much time convicting Leibniz uh, in the second decade of the 18th century as he did on actually writing the Principia in the first place. So, um, how do we uh, solve a problem like this? Um, you need access to everything Newton wrote. Right? Uh, it needs to be uh, published, it needs to be easily accessible. Um, I think that although there is compartmentalization, um, I think there's also connections between areas of Newton's work. I just think we haven't found them, we haven't asked the right questions, we haven't been clever enough, uh, we haven't had people who've uh, been able to, to look at everything uh, Newton wrote uh, in an easy way. Um, we need to be able to specify uh, synchronically, so at any one point in time, how Newton cuts up his world. It's not science and religion, but there are separate uh, domains. Um, I think uh, prophecy is a discipline uh, or a, a genre. I mean, wh whether they're disciplines or genres is, is an interesting question. I think chronology is a discipline. Um, I think scriptural exegesis, so the study of specific texts, is a sub-domain. Uh, I think that alchemy is a domain. I think natural philosophy is a domain, except natural philosophy itself is split into two, in my view, into two separate components. You know, one of them is physicalist, that you see in the optics and in uh, other writings. Uh, where he is prepared to talk sometimes hypothetically about things like ethers and so on. And then I think there's another side to his natural philosophy, uh, which is the, the, the language of the Principia, which draws more from mixed mathematics as opposed to standard natural philosophy. And I think those are, those are real domains. They are separate domains in his thinking, and he compartmentalizes them. Um, with the online environment, the archive can be published, uh, reconstituted, uh, <coughs> dated, and ordered. And I also think something that is, is a great interest to me, uh, and we haven't really yet done it because it's a big ask, is to understand how within these separate domains, Newton executes certain projects. And these projects evolve over time, and sometimes these projects bleed into each other. And none of these projects are ever finished. And that goes for optics and Principia. These things are never finished. And Newton's quite unusual, I think, in comparison with some of his contemporaries, in, in never being satisfied with what he's done. It tells you something about Newton. And all these things tell you something about Newton. Um, now, I wanted to say that there might not be one Newtonian essence, perhaps, that, that marks everything he does. Um, but I think that there are characteristics that, of Newton that you find in each one. So I don't think you find concepts range, ranging across these different domains, but I do think uh, you find, um, you find uh, I'll talk about this a bit more at the end, but I think you, you do find some recurring themes 
in everything that Newman does. I think one of them being uh, an extraordinary uh, self-belief, arrogance, confidence, uh, courage, you know, which is uh, which is first of all unmatched by practically anyone else, and secondly, I think it's fundamentally religious, and he believes that he's been specially chosen by God, uh, and he's damn well going to um, make sure that uh, he's going to be the best he can be. He's going to make sure he's not going to die wondering um, with, his, with his various projects. Um, I, I left this in because uh, this is a remnant from a previous talk, but I, I, the Newton project uh, has been going for a while. Um, and I just wanted to uh, talk about the, uh, the sort of anti-origins of, of the Newton project. Um, but there's some, for those of you that are interested in, in editing uh, editorial projects, there's some extremely interesting writings from the great uh, Newton scholar uh, Bernard Cohen in the late 60s and 70s, just as a number of his works were coming to fruition where he gave a list of desiderata, uh, things that he would like if he had the time and money. Um, and what he, he came to a very interesting conclusion, uh, which is that print can never capture uh, what is required uh, to do justice to Newton. Um, and he's just talking, there would be various plans for editions going back to the 1850s. In fact, there's a parliamentary debate in the 1850s about whether the British state should support such an undertaking. But then, as now, uh, the Brits have been on their own. They, they singularly refuse to uh, honour uh, their greatest scientists in the way that all other countries honour their scientists with uh, national editions. Um, in the early 20th century, there were more plans to do a collective edition, uh, 1930. Seven, uh, the Royal Society started the collection of letters for the uh, edition of uh, Newton's correspondence, which appeared first of all in 1959 and finally appeared in 1977. Um, but the the idea of publishing these texts was um, was very bitty and partial. Uh, it took Cohen a very long period of time. Uh, to get his edition of Newton's Principia published. So it was supposed to appear, first of all, in 1963, uh, and it finally appeared in 1999, uh, just before he died. Uh, it, it, these are very big undertakings. Uh, the idea that you could actually publish everything Newton wrote uh, is, is beyond Cohen's ken. But what Cohen says just for the natural sciences, indeed just for the Principia papers, uh, applies by equal steps uh, to thinking about uh, an, an edition of all of Newton's writings. So, New so Cohen says, you can't do a print edition of Newton's uh, writings in the exact sciences uh, because it would be too much work and it wouldn't be funded, even in the United States. Uh, print can't exhaustively capture the totality of an archive or a part of an archive. Um, as you go into print, and the, the Leibniz people who've been working since 1901 on their edition, uh, as you go into print, you will find that uh, a new tranche of materials is discovered. Uh, and what you will have to do is to have an extra volume at the end, which is a volume of all the things that are not in the first uh, X volumes. And then, of course, while that X plus one volume is being done, new material appears, so you have to have another volume, which is a volume of all the things that weren't in the first, etc, etc, etc. And that's a real problem of print. And I think Cohen also said something very, uh, very salient, which is that um, print confers an aura on what is not printed. So uh, within the profession of scholarship, uh, historians automatically go to where the, the treasure is. Uh, whenever a, a print edition comes out, it, it automatically increases the, the, the value of stuff that's still in archives. <coughs> you know, it's stuff that gets published. You know, when people referee articles, uh, if, if you as an author can claim that you've discovered something new in an archive, it carries a hell of a lot more weight than discovering something new, which is highly unlikely, in a print edition. Um, 
Moreover, uh, Cohen decried the, uh, the, the, the sort of sen what he called seigneurial or kind of dictatorial role of the editor. Uh, why should the editor's select selectorial <coughs> policies uh, dictate uh, what you read? Uh, the editor may well have missed out some of the most important writings, uh, even in what he or she has decided, in that domain that he or she has decided to work in. Um, you know, there are, all, there are so many problems with the print edition that uh, Cohen decided that, that one shouldn't do anything, actually, um, which, is, which is interesting. He was still working on the edition of the Principia, which is a self-contained entity, but, but really um, there was not much room to, to engage in the very large projects that, um, that he wanted to do. In the mid-90s, uh, a group of us had an idea of publishing, um, in, in the wake of what Cohen had said, we, we realised that the, uh, the online environment, which was nascent, embryonic, uh, and a wild west, we, we realised that paradoxically it could be the basis for uh, excellent, it could be the basis for uh, exhaustivity, or, I mean, not, not merely comprehensive, but exhaustively publishing everything Newton wrote. Uh, it would be searchable, it would be revisable, so you don't have the problem of uh, X plus one, X plus two volumes, because you just add stuff in, you just put it in. Um, it's continually, continuously improvable. Um, it's extensible uh, over time, and it can be made to link to a whole series of other texts. You know, we, we now have access to, uh, I think, virtually every book written in English online. Um, we have access online to every book written in English before 1850, uh, which is incredible. Um, you know, the, there's another great story to tell about uh, ProQuest uh, taking these microfilms that have been created by Americans uh, in the late 1930s, uh, going through libraries across Europe uh, because they felt that the, the Nazi menace was going to destroy civilization. They took microfilms of all the books that are not in the Widener Library in Harvard and one or two other libraries, and they microfilmed them. And these microfilms formed the basis of uh, early English books online and 18th century collections online, which are now the, the, the main uh, sources for people all around the world to look at English writing texts. But with what we've done with the Newton project, uh, we, we, can, uh, we, we can allow simultaneous searching, we can allow people to look simultaneously at chunks of text and compare them with other chunks of text written by other people. I and mean, this is something that, that was unimaginable 30 or uh, years ago. Um, exhaustivity. Uh, so the, the potential to publish everything stops um, editorial selectivity. It stops the problems that Cohen identified of there just being uh, a partial uh, publication of, of Newton's writing. Um, new tools uh, which are, are coming to fruition, in fact they're already available on on uh, Bill Newman's Chemistry of Isaac Newton site. Uh, new tools such as latent semantic analysis can allow uh, people to take one paragraph or one chunk of text and find the closest text to that text elsewhere in the archive. So, in a <coughs> sense, you, you don't have to... Uh, I mean, this is, this is uh, one of them's de-skilling, but it does things that experts can't do. You take one sentence, you take one paragraph, uh, you stick it into the machine on one side, and you say, you simply say, find the closest paragraph in a particular domain of text, and it will find it. I mean, it's an extraordinary, uh, it's an extraordinary facility. I mean, it, it, it does allow, it raises the possibility, of course, of, of unediting uh, all of the texts that have been broken up since the 20th of March, 1727, and even before, because Newton broke up and messed up his own text. I mean, we can reconstitute all these texts with latent semantic analysis. Uh, you know, we, we can find uh, we can find disparate <coughs> documents, 
and show that they are part of a larger document. You can't do that uh, unless you've been working on Newton for 160 years, and no one can do that. Yeah. Um, Newton can be contextualized by embedding his text in a wider ocean of text. Uh, and I think, as a result of the Newton Project, people, this is where human judgment really comes in. Uh, as a result of the Newton Project, new views on Newton can emerge. Um, uh, I, I mean, I speak uh, autobiographically. In my work, my work has benefited, uh, obviously, enormously, as has other people's, from the existence of the Newton Project. We can find some of the if you like, ethical, core ethical values that motivate Newton in all of his writings. You can't do that otherwise. You just simply can't do that. We can find uh, that he is committed to uh, the role of the understanding. I and mean, we can see this in his, um, in his theological writings. Uh, we can see it uh, cropping up all over the place. Uh, we can make connections between his distrust of hypotheses, systems, uh, his distrust of the imagination, uh, his own self-discipline, uh, his own control of his own lust, uh, his own tendencies to lust, uh, the way in which he sees his animosity towards idols, towards carnality, and towards systems as fundamentally deriving all from a, a kind of core hatred of fictions and poetry. I mean, he makes a virtue out of hating poetry, which is slightly surprising, but there you go, that's what the man is like. He cannot abide fictions, and as a consequence of all of that, we can see connections uh, throughout his writings. You, you, so new connections emerge just as we engage in the act of uh, compartmentalizing. Um, we want, I, I wrote this last year, it may, it may now be 2030, but... Um, <laughs> We want to do everything by 2025, so we want to make everything available online by 2025. Um, and we want to make it freely available. Uh, we want to show what all his sources are. Uh, we want to link every document to, to uh, high quality color images so that you can uh, get new information. You know, more information than you would do if you actually were present to the document. And some of these images give you more information than if you actually saw the documents itself. Um, we want to give people that opportunity. So, as it were, this is the continuous, uh, I, I see it as the continuous exploding of you, breaking it down into individual textual elements in order to uh, reconstruct him at the end. Um, that's a picture of the Newton Project. This is a picture of um, <coughs> one of the uh, collaborations we had with Cambridge. Um, this is a fundamental collaborative enterprise. Uh, I think that to create something this big, we need to, it has to be a worldwide effort. That's why we've got connections now with French scholars, uh, Chinese scholars, uh, and other people who are performing extremely useful work, but also with the general public. Um, there is the Indiana Chemistry Project run by Bill Newman, which has put nearly all of Newton's alchemical writings online. Um, Cambridge University Digital Library has published all of uh, images of all of Newton's writings in Cambridge. So they're, they're all there. Uh, everything. I mean, that, that, that is an exhaustive compilation of images of all of the documents that Cambridge has by Isaac Newton. I mean, it's a fantastic resource. They're, they're high quality color images. Uh, Newton Project Canada has produced a number of transcriptions of Newton's prophetic stuff, which is, uh, you know, potentially infinite. I mean, this stuff is, is massive. God knows how much, how, you know, how many people have the time to do all this. I mean, it's, it is ex extraordinary. And we have a very strong partnership with the National Library of Israel, uh, who own 95% of Newton's uh, religious documents. Just to finish, um, I'm interested in how the, the online environment can help us learn about Newton's creativity. Um, I know Nicolo is interested in how Newton reuses his work in mathematics. We, we want to know how Newton's work coheres horizontally, so how he compartmentalizes it. We want to know how his projects develop over time. He doesn't date his work. He doesn't refer to other events going on outside his life. 
he's more interested in fourth century debates than he is about anything going on. It's hard to date his writings. It's hard to place them in, in an order. Uh, but that is what we that is what we can begin to do with the uh, online project. To look at the way he reused his work, ordered it. Uh, we want to understand really what the essence of his creativity is. We, we think we can work out how he does it. Uh, and the jury is still out as to whether there are low, deep line connections between the various items of Newton's thought. I'm not, I, I want to find something that is, is a bedrock, you know, core principle that Newton uses to link various areas of his work. I mean, at, at one level, it's compartmentalized, there's no doubt about that, but perhaps there's something that would be Newton himself, <coughs> who is the puppet master, uh, underlying all these uh, different things. And finally, we, we want our edition to be, uh, you know, the fit for the uh, 21st century. It will be exhaustive, uh, collaborative, and uh, a massive amount of fun, and it's freely available. And that's the end of the story. Thank you. <laughs>
but even even when one finds connections or makes connections, one sees subtle differences between uh, the way in which you perform in certain areas, which is what, as I said, which is what I would expect because these at a high level are different disciplines with different traditions of proof, argument, use of evidence. They use different concepts. And one of the things about Newton is he's able, as many people are, obviously in, in this period, he's able to just move from one domain to another with the different roles and, and authorial identities that are required in each field. So he's a litigator for some of his day. And for another part of his day, he's a natural philosopher. And then sometimes, you know, in the evening, he's a mathematician. And in the morning, he's gone to work at the Royal Mint. Uh, Rob, I have a, a question that well, actually concerns uh, your work. And uh, I'm thinking, while you were giving this very beautiful lecture, I was thinking uh, that you are still a professor of intellectual history at Sussex University. And uh, there is, with Stefan Collini and, uh, and others, Sussex is famous for you know, promoting the, an interpretation of intellectual history that favors a synchronic view of, of culture, the explosion of the notions of author, of, 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 um, of uh, text, and uh, study, a synchronic study of, uh, and, uh, and uh, interdisciplinary study of, of, yeah. of, of uh, the cultural domain. You come from Cambridge, and uh, I'm thinking, well, while you were beginning your talk, Kentin Skinner came to my mind. I mean, his work in the 50s, I uh, referring to his work, Method and, Interpre yeah. and Interpretation, these two ideas, that begins by saying that as a historian of uh, political thought, uh, because he is a historian of political thought, we have to avoid the, to write the history of political thought uh, as a history that concerns a series of canonical texts. Yeah. And um, he talks about uh, the mythologies that uh, in, when, when, when doing political history like that. One is the mythology of coherence, mm -hmm. uh, the idea that uh, a single author uh, must, uh, uh, you, you have to, ex the, the, the beauty of the history of political thought is to extract a coherent doctrine out of, 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 a, of a canonical yeah. text, and then the mythology of, uh, of doc doctrine, so the idea that we can project our, our doctrines in the past and so on and so forth. So, well, I'm thinking about what you are doing. Um, you are, do you consider all this stuff as something that is somehow related to this tradition and uh, there is something new? And uh, how do you position yourself vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis this tradition that is so close to your place of work and your, and, and, and your alma mater, I would say so? Um, I have a long story. I, I try, try and keep it short. But I, I come from a different tradition. Mm -hmm. I come from a tradition of history of science, uh, and I was initially trained as a, an intellectual historian of science, having come from philosophy and physics, uh, but very quickly I became interested in the sociology of science. What I think is fascinating about the sociology of science is that there are uh, anti-essentialist, anti-foundationalist critiques. Uh, made at exactly the same time as people like Skinner and then John Donne. I mean, John Donne's book on John Locke is, is a, it's not a, an application of Skinnerism, but you know, Donne in, in that book makes a, a number of, uh, I think, quite helpful comments on the dangers of coherentism. Uh, so where I come from, in the first place, where, where I was trained was to detect uh, myths. Uh, and historiographical, herd-like behavior uh, of the kind that I've mentioned. And I do understand, you know, I, I, I was also, obviously I was, uh, I, I was faced with two, two problems when I did my PhD in the late 1980s. You know, one of them is the entire field in uh, natural, uh, in, in the history of science was, was moving towards not, not just the modern period, but it was towards an understanding of knowledge as essentially public. The sociology of science, sociology of knowledge, uh, has a, a very strong presumption that there can be no private knowledge. Uh, knowledge is what's happened when something goes outside 
of the mind onto the table, but really it starts when it goes out into the wider world, it's processed by referees and is then published and available for discussion. I mean, that, that, that is uh, a core view of the sociology of knowledge, and that is, um, that was the first problem, because I was working on a man who, <laughs> you know, he, his theological views were kept secret from virtually everybody, and, and I, had no, I had nothing to go on. You know, nobody had looked at this work in detail before. Uh, and, and I was alone in a room for three years. No, I'm not, I'm not going to cry, honestly, but I was alone in a, in a room for three years above the manuscripts room in Cambridge University Library uh, with two microfilm reels that had to be done by hand, uh, going through the, the six microfilm reels of the stuff that's uh, in Jerusalem. Yes, yes. Uh, um, and, you know, what, what, I, what took me three years uh, can be done in a month now in terms of, well, maybe in two weeks, in terms of research. But of course, you know, you know being exposed to this material was, was greatly beneficial for me. So, uh, in that sense, although I was trained up in the sociology of science and many of the anti-foundationalist stuff that you see in Skinner and elsewhere, it's all contextual, obviously, um, I, I couldn't apply it in my own work very easily. It's very difficult to uh, apply those things, except in you know wh where you have the the works of people like Dobbs, Manuel, and so on and so forth. But I, I sympathise with what they're doing. I sympathise with their efforts to fight back against positivism. Uh, I I just think you can see some of the things they say about everything in Newton's mind was connected. Uh, I mean, they, they, they say virtually similar things in, you know, the Janus Faces of Genius, which is 1992, and, and uh, Manuel's book, which is 1974. Um, they say similar things. Uh, they're, they're, they're deep expressions of their desire to unify you. You can see why they're saying it, but they end up being utterly banal. You know, there was one mind of Newton, and Newton had one goal, the pursuit of truth. That doesn't get you very far, does it? Really? Is that the best you can do? Uh, I'm sorry, it's not good enough. Um, and and it, 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 it's just, it, I, <coughs> with the Newton project, I think you can go beyond that and ask the kinds of questions that are much more easily uh, asked of people like Locke and others in that, in that particular tradition. Um, I think now we can do that. Now we, so we can show how Newton is like other men. <laughs> is he like other men? Yeah. <laughs> uh, There's a famous comment made about Newton. Uh, allegedly asked about Newton in 1696. You know, does he uh, live, drink, sleep, breathe like other men? Uh, yeah, I think he does, to some extent. Um, but it's the, uh, to some extent, it's the, yeah, it's the issue. Um, but I, I never place myself in that in that tradition, I, I come from a different tradition, and I, and I think that it, it's not a coincidence, well, it is a, it's a miraculous conjunction, but it's not a coincidence that, that people in different fields developed these approaches at, at the same time. You know, you've got uh, new techniques, different fields, uh, a new generation of people who are freed up to see that, that many of the shibboleths of standard <coughs> historical work in in history of science and intellectual history, are based on a, a series on a series of categories that are unsupportable. Um, and I, I think it's a very interesting research project to compare the critiques of the early Edinburgh School with the critiques of Skinner and others, because I think they're very similar. They're, they're, they're after the same issues. They're anti-foundationists, etc. Et so, Christian. Yeah. Um, I think you've raised the touch on it, so which is probably a good segue. Um, I guess I'm wondering, um, do you think the, do, do you think it's worthwhile kind of just just focusing in on the texts in and of themselves that they sort of, um, or and like, do you think it's a mistake to focus, say, too closely on aspects of Newton's personal life and things like that? I mean, today at lunch, um, issues of you know Newton's sexuality and. Mm. Things like that came up, and you know, um, you were, I think you were down the other end of the table. But, um, I, I, could, I wasn't sure how how far down the table people were listening, but um, but then you know, I, I, I wondered, um, you know, some of those details might sort of help us to index some of the 
manuscript material, but then I wondered if maybe that sort of muddies the water and that's a red herring. No, I think that's a great point. I, I think that uh, the two things. What, what, one is that the, the, the availability of the Newton project reconfigures the relationship, uh, the balance between human judgment and uh, machine performance. Uh, because the machine can do vast numbers of things, but you have to use this properly. And with respect, with respect to the, the first element of human judgment, what this does is allow you to, to drill down really closely uh, in a way that you can't do otherwise uh, into you know, not just documents, but parts of documents. Um, when I talk about this project in a different field within digital humanities, you know, what I would say there is most digital humanities now is, has a fetish for big data, you know, really big data, uh, you know, the Republic of Letters project, blah, 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 and we can find, we can do distant reading, and so on and so forth, and that's great, uh, at one level. But what these, so that's like the, 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 the telescope. Yeah. But this is a microscope, this, this, this is also a microscope. It allows you to drill down really deeply into uh, micro <coughs> elements of text. Um, and I think that the way to use this is, is holistically, it is to, uh, you know, now the image of microscope and telescope doesn't work quite so well. But you have to change the magnificatory power of your historiographical lens. Uh, you have to look at things in a broad context and then go in really deep again, and then you have to go out wide and then go in deep again. I think that what, what this allows you to do is to make those double moves. Uh, and you can do no, I didn't emphasize enough the, the, the in-depth reading, but that is what this allows you to do. So I don't know if that answers your question. Um, but I mean, Newton sex life is, is a great topic. And in fact, you know, we, the, the, we thought it was kind of lowbrow to come up on that. But it's not, because in, in, my, in my view, as I say in my book, you know, Newton sex life, uh, or his lack of it, is key to understanding Newton. And there's one document where he, he effectively describes, in autobiographical terms, how it is that to be, as a good godly person, I can see the silence in the room, people are really interested. Um, he, he talks about techniques for suppressing your sexual appetite. And uh, what, what I say, I think this is absolutely clear, and, and I conclude that Newton must have had real problems with a sexual drive. And he's a bachelor, he's not in the least bit gay, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it wouldn't bother me if he was, but he's not. He, he, he's, he's fascinated by women. And when he talks about 4th and 5th century monks and their strategies for avoiding thinking about women, he, he's clearly talking about himself because he goes from a, from a historical voice into a prescriptive voice, peculiarly. He'll, he'll talk about how all the great founders of what he calls monkery, or what we call monasticism, they all had these uh, fantastic uh, techniques, you know, which are standard uh, Roman Catholic techniques for uh, avoiding the sins of the flesh, which is by embracing temptation and then, as a, as, a, as, a, as a soldier, as a Christian soldier, conquering it, like Jesus Christ did. But Newton says, but they're not Jesus Christ. They all fail. And Newton says, I suspect that they deliberately invited thoughts of women. And he, he, he's got a wonderful line where he says, you know, uh, some of the things these people uh, describe in their dreams, you know, Pacomius, Antony, Jerome, all these people, some of these people, some of the things they describe in their dreams are too disgusting to write down. And he says, but for the sake of uh, history, I'm going to write them down. And he goes, he goes through it. And he says, yeah, so pages of description of the, the sexual dreams, usually Ethiopian dancing women, um, and, you know, nightmares about hyenas devouring one's genitals, which follow from the, the torture of this. And, and then you will say, this was all wrong because the way to avoid thinking about women is to be never at rest. And you will recognize that that is the title of Richard Westfall's great biography of Newton. And that is Newton's recipe, like many other radical Protestants. It's his recipe for avoiding the sins of the flesh, which is to be constantly working. But there is the issue of the imagination and the, the inflammation, the deliberate inflammation of the imagination, the images of women is it, it runs throughout that 
critique of uh, monastic uh, sexuality. I mean, th that material is, is really extraordinary, I think. Um, and I, when I talked about it at the Huntington Library, you know, there were historians of sex who you know more about that than I do, and they, and they think that's one of the most interesting texts that there is uh, on you know, radical Protestant attitudes towards uh, sexual continence. Uh, I mean, Newton is interested in celibacy, which is the, you know, a career of continence. But he's also interested in practices of, of continence as well. So it's, it's the kind of stuff that Michel Foucault would have, uh, would have absolutely loved. Uh, he writes about, you know, one of Newton's core texts is, is, um, is uh, what Foucault uses in his great article, The Battle of Chastity. Um, but Newton's, Newton is, it, you know, Newton is living this. He's living it. I mean, after he died, and people realised that he not married, because that's coded even in 1727. Uh, and you know, Voltaire reported that that his physician Richard Mead had said uh, he'd never known a woman. Uh, well, people even then found that strange. But I, I don't think that's strange for a, a bachelor like Newton. He, he is to be placed in a cohort of people who are like that. I mean, that that's what we try and do. I think at one level as historians is to try and find out who Newton is. You know, who, is who is he like? And he's like a lot of these people. He's like Henry Moore. He's like, well, Ralph Cubworth is, is married, but yeah, it, it, he's, he's like these people. Um, he's not so much like John Locke. But they're both bachelors. But anyway, that's what interests me. This stuff interests me. And I do think that the, that the personal self-discipline lies at the heart of uh, a lot of Newton's problems, you know, as, as if his own imagination, which is actually inside his head, you know, th this is this terrible thing that's torturing him, and he has to control it. I have a much more banal question. <laughs> uh, possibly paradoxical, maybe that's just how philosophers are, so forgive that. But uh, you can see how, on the one hand, this project, which as you know I've used many times and sent my students to many times, um, gets us closer to the historical Newton, the actual person who was up late at night, um, apparently doing all sorts of things uh, most people didn't know about in history. But on the other hand, it might get us further from the historical Newton. Because paradoxically, since so much of what he did was completely unknown, and since so much of 18th century culture is about Newton and Newtonianism and the figure of Newton and the Enlightenment and all these constructions in which he figured, which really had nothing to do with any of this secret stuff, yeah. is there a paradox there that it gets us further away from the person who influenced history and whose influence had so much to do with these few texts that were published and these few public views mm -hmm. And so little to do with all this fascinating material that no one knew about. Um, I, I, I take your point. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's difficult to go back to the past and find out what Newton thought about Newton while still bearing in mind that we now know what he was doing in private. But it does lead us to the, to the issue of Newton's agency in creating the particular image he did, which I think is, is fascinating. I mean, Stephen Snowball wrote a very good article um, 15 years ago, uh, the, the strategies of the Nicodemite, uh, mm -hmm. PJHS 1999. Um, but I think that we, we now know a lot more about how Newton uh, gives selective uh, entrance to various people. I mean, we were talking about David Gregory earlier on. Um, there are trusted people he lets into his secrets, uh, and he manages his um, his his outward facing. Uh, reputation, I think very carefully. Um, I think the last few years of his life, he's also managing his legend very carefully by uh, getting uh, various disciples, telling stories that he knows are going to be told down in the years that will be constitutive of the Newton legend, as it were. Um, and I, I think it's there is something to be deduced from the fact he didn't burn his papers. Now you can say, there's a number of things that one can deduce from that. Um, I mean, a minimal one is he, he didn't think that they were so hideously heretical 
that they would cause problems for his reputation and or his family after his death. But, you know, there is some discussion, you know, from Whiston and others that uh, Newton thought that they would be useful uh, in the event of, of the kind of um, godliness that was required for Jesus Christ to return uh, just before the millennium. So he thought when the time was right, someone could, you know, 1998, <laughs> someone could publish these. Uh, and it would help affect uh, the, the kind of reformation of manners that would help usher in the millennium. I mean, the unfortunate thing for Newton is, you know, the, the, the devil reaches the peak of his powers in the three and a half years before the, <laughs> the advent of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, but, um, and I think m most of Newton's followers today, there are millions of people in the US uh, who believe pretty much what Newton believed. Um, and uh, their, their view is that devil will rise up in, in uh, Romania. <laughs> uh, Newton, Newton didn't specify that the devil would rise up there. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the way in which Newton manages his uh, reputation is, is related to your question. So, I don't think it's paradoxical. We, we, we bear in mind all the time, I think, the, uh, the difference between the private and the public. I mean, the, we've got a nice interview by our, the, the very last interview of Albert Einstein is on our website. It's the most popular part of the website. <laughs> uh, and the interview was conducted in 1955 by Bernard Cohen, two weeks before Ooh. Einstein died. And um, uh, um, McLachlan had just published a, a, an edition of Newton's Theological Papers. And Cohen asked him, what he thought about it, and yeah, very surprisingly, uh, uh, yeah, Einstein says this is Newton's spiritual workshop, uh, and he, he has a right uh, for these papers to remain unpublished. So Einstein saw it as a, a sort of voyeuristic thing, and the reason he sees it like that is because he himself had been uh, the victim of paparazzi uh, for much of his life. Yeah. Uh, people who tried <coughs> to find out the truth about his yeah. his daughter, his marriage, etc., etc. So, you know, he, he identifies with me <laughs> in terms of wanting to avoid the, the, the prying academic paparazzi who, unfortunately, the, you know, barbarically burst through the gates and published all this stuff. Yes, I wonder, is it possible to see the Christian Christ in the Bible? Is it live? Yeah, yeah um, there is um, password is What's the password? My yeah, list of students. Hmm? What do you want to see um, the uh, sex stuff? No, 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 <laughs> some So, uh, Leibniz. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we, we, we will change the clock. clock. Yeah. 
much, and this is about 100 million results, but, um, I mean, but, but, but at this point, it becomes a browser. Uh, for image, for example, um, I can do that by going to a different site for the scientific reference, mm -hmm. if that's, So this is uh, if you if this is Cambridge University Library, uh, digital so Cambridge University Digital Library. Uh, if you just type in C E D L uh, Newton, it will go straight to here. Um, let's try uh, so three nine five. So. So this is the uh, graduate notebook. Um, have, have, have you seen this site? Do, do you know this site? Are, are those of you that are interested in the I mean, this is an extraordinary site. You, you really, uh, if you're interested in looking, uh, doing primary research on Newton's scientific materials, you, uh, everything, I think hard, there's hardly anything that is not here. Uh, there is some stuff in the Royal Society of London, but nearly everything is at Cambridge in the Portsmouth and Macclesfield collections. Uh, this is Newton's Trinity Undergraduate Notebook. Um, I'm not sure where. Uh, let's try more. So this is still, that's still this um, scholastic notes. So this is I'm trying to get to the start of um, certain philosophical questions. Yeah. This is near the start. There we go. So, in fact, let's go back uh, a bit. So, here, these are the notes from Descartes. Matter. So, this, so this is um, is there, there's a new, obviously as, as I did this, there's a new interface here which I've not tested or not looked at. Um, this is Aristotle is a friend, uh, but truth is uh, is the greatest friend or a greater friend. Uh, and then it's quite the honest uh, approach, um, which doesn't last very long. There are only sort of I think there are four or five entries that are in this tradition. The first entries on atoms are are very scholastic. He's trying to find out uh, <coughs> what, what the smallest things are that exist. So so can there be things that are the smallest things? Uh, and he decides that there are the smallest things, but he already decides that if there are the smallest things, there must be a gap between them, and if there's a gap between them, there must be a vacuum. And there must always have been a vacuum. So God must have created a vacuum at the beginning of time, because there's no reason for a vacuum to have formed naturally uh, between the beginning of time to where he is now. Uh, so, I mean, this is a a very interesting scholastic way of proving the existence of a vacuum. The next, um, the 
next uh, slides will be more things to do. We have um, <coughs> So normally on this site, with all the scientific works we've done, we can see all, all of the scientific transcriptions are, and mathematical. So most of the major mathematical works, if not all the major mathematical works, are transcribed uh, and available. But the, I think it's fair to say that the transcriptions of the great, the two great mathematical notebooks, uh, the transcriptions are illegible. That, I, I mean they're unreadable. But the point is that they're searchable. So the, the, the point of transcriptions is simultaneously to be readable as ends in themselves, normally. Uh, but they're also important as things that you can search through. So they're, they're, they're means to an end as well as ends in themselves. Um, but for some reason, we're, we're unable to connect them out. But normally you can see them side by side, and when you, when you go to the next page, the, the, the transcription will go as well. Um, well, but uh, only Cambridge has the facility to, to mount that in a sustainable, I mean, preservationist way on its own website. And I think that that is a problem that we've faced uh, in in recent years, which is that uh, you know when we when we started off, we were pioneering, and then with, after about ten years, everybody was doing what we were doing, uh, and now it looks like the only places that can sustain projects of this kind are the, the sort of big traditional universities that have sufficient money to do it, which I think is very, very unfortunate. But if, if, you know, from personal experience, I can tell you that, you, that a smaller university cannot uh, safeguard these, these <coughs> resources. Um, but for those of you that are interested, the, the, the Certain Philosophical Questions textbook has got uh, many or, or most of the, the general philosophical positions that, that Newton will um, adopt later on. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, fant it's a fantastically interesting uh, document. Mm -hmm. it, again, it, it repays going back to, if you're interested in the history of science, uh, it, it just it repays constant return. To, to look at what he's doing, and if you, if you get into it, you can see the development of his thought. Uh, and you can see the way Newton works. You can see, you can see the way that, that Newton turns questions, you know, criticisms of Descartes, Henry Moore, and others, how he turns them into uh, researchable, uh, empirical research programs. Uh, and I think that, that's something that stays with him throughout the rest of his career. To underline the fact that you just out, you outline a very interesting unifying factor of Newton thought. That this is how he does with every yep. subject that he picks up. He turns yep. it into an empirical research project. That's right. that the unified kind of enough for a unified picture, finding a man behind the work. That, that's a, that's yeah. a characteristic of no, I, I know, the I know, of that, working. Definitely. And today someone would say, well, that's a very scientific. Feature yeah, yeah. that he is transforming everything into an empirical project and he is only publishing what he thinks is finished. Yep. Keep the rest. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's definitely, uh, it, it, despite the, the great certitude with which he speaks and writes sometimes, there's also a, uh, a surprising provisionalism about that's built into his system. You know, the, the, the theory will be refined perhaps by new evidence and uh, the refined theory will point in the direction of new evidence. That's true, and I think that's the case in a number of different domains in which he works. Mm -hmm. That's also true of Boyle and other people, so that doesn't seem to be um, specific to that's, a Newtonian mind. No, but that's, that's right, and that's the problem, isn't it? 
But why does it have to be specific to the mind? I mean, well, well, I mean, if you, you were talking about the connection this. between <laughs> yeah. this project and that project, yes. is there a connection? There is a connection. A, a common yes. style of approach. No, no, I think that's right. But it will be the, but obviously it, it, it will be the specific, the particular way in which he does that. Mm -hmm. That, 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 makes, that, that makes the Marx Mouse different from mm -hmm. uh, Boyle. I, I, I think the way Newton proceeds is very different from, from others, anybody else. <coughs> mm -hmm. But as, as Newton would say, I, I will not undertake to defend that comment here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take this as a closing remark <laughs> and thank you all. Yeah.